I will start talking about oh one of my favorite topics, two of my favorite topics combined, mindfulness and ethics. Um, I guess they're... <laughs> You know, pre prior to really getting into Buddhism, uh, I had my own judgments about ethics and morality and whatnot. Um, but now I've certainly gotten past those judgments and, and really do like what we do here at Wild Heart as far as ethics go. And I've just been on a mindfulness kick, you know. I think you might hear me talk about mindfulness all this month and all next month just because... I think it's such a important topic and I, there's so many ways that we can mindfulness together. Um, you know, I did mindfulness of mindfulness of body, but like meditation postures and activities. And this is kind of a continuation of that because the activities that we get into is what we're applying ethics to. Um, and then I also did some mindfulness of eating, which I really loved. And uh, my partner, Joe, did some mindfulness of mind. They're the more mind person and the more body somatic person. Um, and we learn a lot from each other in our practices. Uh, so what I'm going to do... Oh, the ice cream song's playing. I don't know. I don't know what y'all can hear on that side. If this uh, even does a good job at like muting that stuff, I'm just going to keep talking over it and not let my mind wander off to ice cream land and stick with the uh, mindfulness of what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, so we'll take some time to define mindfulness. Uh, some mindfulness meditation practices like we just did. Uh, I'll take some time to define ethics and then what the Buddhist ethics are all about. Um, I'll suggest that as a result of ethics and ethical practice, ethical mindfulness, if you will, uh, the, the result is compassion. It's this really wonderful compassion practice um, and relate how compassion is integral, integral to this goal of liberation. You know, um, so Buddhist practice has a lot to do with mindfulness. Uh, it's a meditation practice. Mindfulness is an everyday practice, an everyday all the time practice. Um, and this ideal that is connected with many other concepts and practices. And each school of Buddhism has their own little things about mindfulness. I'm particularly talking about our own uh, wild heart school if you will. Um, so I see mindfulness as a non-reactive awareness that aids in the development of experiential wisdom. It provides insight into the marks of existence and these other things that we talk about in uh, Wild Heart and Buddhism. Those marks of existence are impermanence, imperfection, and uh, non-self-identification. And mindfulness allows for a foundation for and is the building block of compassion on the path of liberation. You know, the Buddha taught that there are four noble truths. There is suffering. There's an end to suffering. Um, nope, sorry. There's a cause of suffering. The cause of suffering is craving. There is an end to suffering. And there's this eightfold path um, that we can utilize to end suffering and mindfulness is part of that eightfold path um and being in that whole kind of container uh noble truth container it really has a lot to do with this goal of ending suffering and understanding it and understanding craving and getting towards the end of suffering um so we can practice mindfulness meditation and gain these insights and and this wisdom and bring them into everyday mindfulness practice. Uh, a Thai forest monk, Ajahn Chah, said, the point is to use mindfulness to see the underlying truth. With this mindfulness, we watch all desires, likes and dislikes, pleasures and pains that arise in the mind, realizing they are impermanent, suffering and empty of self, we let go of them. 
In this way, wisdom replaces ignorance. Knowledge replaces doubt. So the goal, like I said, this non-reactive awareness. Um, we want to use mindfulness to be able to respond. But I don't use mindfulness as a way to react. I don't think that that's... I think that reaction is kind of the antithesis of mindfulness. Um, in ethics, how we respond and how we react. Um, I looked up the definition of ethics on Google and it said, moral principles that govern a person's behavior or conducting of an activity. Um, and immediately went, ugh, govern. Why are we using this language? Um, so I'm, I'm replacing govern with interrelate. I really like that kind of like, you know, so moral principles that interrelate with a person's behavior and the conducting of an activity. This is ethics. This is what I'm talking about when I, when I discuss ethics and Buddhist ethics is much more pointed in this focus of like liberation of lessening suffering. So these moral principles that we're using uh, and integrating into the behavior and activity that we bring into the world, that I bring into the world, uh, has a has, is really rooted in uh, these these Buddhist understandings of what suffering is. So Buddhist ethics, I think, pertains to wholesome actions that revolve around the intention not to cause harm to self or others. Um, it's kind of the opposite of, like I said, kind of the opposite of this reactivity that, you know, I see in culture and I see in myself. I'm a reflected, reflection of, uh, of culture of uh, America. <laughs> So uh, I see the reactive drive that I have um, to all this stuff. And that comes from a place of greed, hatred, and confusion. Greed, hatred, delusion, aversion, you know, um, craving. These are all those, all those kind of phrases are intertwined there. But greed, hatred, and confusion is uh, really integrated and integral in suffering so as i am becoming more mindful of my own practice of my own internal landscape when i sit and meditate and start to bring that non-reactive awareness and become responsive to what's going on uh i'm building the foundation for ethics um and then i'm able to start to bring that into the world and i think that's where in the satipatthana sutta the buddha is talking about when we're he encourages us to be mindful of activities internal external and both internal and external um you know i really need to know what i'm doing and i really need to know how I'm causing suffering to myself and others and know what I could do to not do that. Um, because one of the, one of the, one of the great things I remember discussing uh, is like, you can be really, really mindful and do something really awful. Let's not go to the most awful thing. Let's like say rob a bank, you know, you can be really mindful and rob a bank. And is that like the most wholesome activity? It might be, you know, the capitalism is <laughs> like stated earlier, killing us all. <laughs> so uh, maybe, maybe it's, it's, uh, it's in that gray area, but um I think that the risk of of harming others could be high due to the 
uh, fact that people arm themselves to guard that stuff. Um, but I guess what I'm saying here is taking a look at those things. You know, you could be really mindful and rob a bank, but is that the most wholesome like activity and action that a person can take? Um, I don't think so. And there are some of the some of the livelihood actions of like selling poison that the Buddha discussed against, advised against. So you know maybe we can we can talk about that. Um, not that's intentionally not causing harm. Is not selling poison. Um, and I think for me it it really drives this compassion practice as well understanding loving kindness and being loving and kind to myself and to others and as i learned that okay uh, selling poisons is harmful what else can i do and i was a uh, i worked making alcohol for a long time so um i did that <laughs> and had and changed my life to be able to go and, and try to help people um and figure out ways that I can be more kind and compassionate to myself and to others in this world, rather than using the world's resources to uh, make and sell poison. Um, so that was the beginning of me being able to respond to myself uh, and my own difficulties and sufferings with these loving kind ways of being in the world and you know as i continue to do it it just keeps getting ingrained it keeps getting ingrained um to the point where recognizing suffering recognizing impermanence imperfection non-self recognizing these moments and integrating a well recognizing these moments has become compassionate action for me Letting go of something, letting go of uh, an uh, argument that I'm playing in my head or letting go of a dialogue I feel like I need to have with somebody um, is a compassionate act for myself these days. And that's born out of the wisdom of driving myself crazy, playing arguments in my head, having these conversations that are going to go nowhere with people uh, and learning from them it's it's a way to show for me that wisdom and compassion are very very inter ingrained there um and then even mindfulness meditation like this mindfulness of breathing becomes a compassion because it's a loving kindness practice of knowing that i'm giving myself the break to be with my body to be with my breath to be to let go of the mind and whenever the mind grabs onto something going okay let's just move back it's okay we're gonna keep doing this i understand what's happening um so even in the internal practice of mindfulness compassion is really there for me um and that's so, you know, ethics, mindfulness, compassion are all real integral in this goal of just of knowing suffering, knowing the end of suffering, knowing the cause of suffering and being able to let go of the cause of suffering to get to the end of suffering in even just little bits. Um, I'm not one to particularly say that like, oh, we can totally, we, you need to totally end suffering right here, right now. While I believe it can be done and good on everybody who is doing it, uh, my experience has been just these little bits, little bits at a time. Uh, I'm able to let go a little bit, I'm able to let go a little bit, able to let go a little bit. And that's been adding up to more and more and more. And hopefully that'll add up to the what to the day where I'm really able to let go a lot and let go of everything and get to that point. But right here right now it's it's uh 
it's just been little bits at a time and it's been working. And I appreciate that. So compassion's so great. Uh, it is this practice of bringing mindfulness to actions and orienting and um, having the intention to cause less harm, orienting ourselves towards that goal uh, in this practice. And building that internal mindfulness, being able to work with the non-reactivity internally to be able to bring that externally into actions with others. Maybe not robbing a bank. Hopefully not selling poisons. Uh, understanding the effects that those things have as far as as far as uh, the harm it could cause to others. The harm it could cause to ourselves. Uh, and it all, it all starts with such a simple practice of mindfulness of breathing you know it's kind of how that kind of the butterfly effect in a way you know it starts so small with something so intimate and such you know 20 minutes here and there and then it just can it snowballs into this bigger effect that allows for more change more good more wholesomeness, more positive action in the world. And allows for yourself, myself, to experience liberation one day, to experience less suffering, a whole release from that. Um, so I think that's what I have for today. I got very excited about this topic. What's up, y'all? Reverend Mikey Noshal here from Wild Heart Meditation Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Thanks for checking us out. Do me a favor, please like and subscribe. And if you feel moved to leave a donation, you can do so at wildheartmeditationcenter.org or the Venmo link in the description. Peace and love.